Reflecting Hanukkah, D.N. Translated by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Sutta-Central.net and Suttas.com. Long Discourses. Samanapala Sutta. To the fruits of recluseship statements of the ministers thus have I heard. On one occasion the exalted. One was dwelling at Rajagaha, in Jivaka Komar of Hakas Mango Grove, together with a large company of 1250 bhikkhus. At the time, on the 15th day of Posatha, the full moon night of Komuti in the fourth month, King Ajatazatu of Magadha, the son of Queen Videha, was sitting on the upper terrace of his palace surrounded by his ministers. There the king uttered the following joyful exclamation. How delightful, friends, is this moonlit night? How beautiful is this moonlit night? How lovely is this moonlit night? How tranquil is this moonlit night? How auspicious is this moonlit night? Is there any recluse or Brahmin that we could visit tonight? Who might be able to bring peace to my mind? Thereupon one of his ministers said, Your Majesty, there is Paranakisapa, the leader of an order, the leader of a group, the teacher of a group, well known and famous, a spiritual leader whom many people esteem as holy. He is aged, long gone forth, advanced in years, in the last phase of life. Your Majesty should visit him. Perhaps he might bring peace to your mind. But when this was said, King Ajatazatu remained silent. Other ministers said, Your Majesty, there is Makhali Gozala, Ajitakesakambala, Pakudhakakana. Sanjaya Bhalatthaputta, Nigantha the leader of an order, the leader of a group, the teacher of a group, well known and famous, a spiritual leader whom many people esteem as holy. He is aged, long gone forth, advanced in years, in the last phase of life. Your Majesty should visit him. Perhaps he might bring peace to your mind. But when this was said, King Ajatazatu remained silent. The Statement of Jivaka Komarabhaka All this time Jivaka Komarabhaka sat silently not far from King Ajatazatu. The king then said to him, Friend Jivaka, why do you keep silent? Jivaka said, Your Majesty, the Exalted One, the Worthy One, the Perfectly Enlightened Buddha, together with a large company of 1250 bhikkhus, is now dwelling in our mango grove. A favorable report concerning him is circulating thus, this exalted one is a worthy one, perfectly enlightened, endowed with clear knowledge and conduct, accomplished, a knower of the world, unsurpassed trainer of men to be tamed, teacher of gods and men, enlightened and exalted. Your majesty should visit the exalted one. Perhaps if you visit him he might bring peace to your mind. Then get the elephant vehicles prepared. Friend Jivaka. Yes, Your Majesty. Jivaka replied. He then had 500 female elephants prepared, as well as the king's personal bull elephant, and announced to the king, Your Majesty, your elephant vehicles are ready. Do as you think fit. King Ajatazatu then had 500 of his women mounted on the female elephants, one on each, while he himself mounted his personal bull elephant. With his attendants carrying torches, he went forth from Rajagaha in full royal splendor, setting out in the direction of Jivaka's mango grove. When King Ajatazatu was not far from the mango grove, he was suddenly gripped by fear, trepidation, and terror. Frightened, agitated, and terror-stricken, he said to Jivaka, You aren't deceiving me, are you, friend Jivaka? You aren't betraying me. You aren't about to turn me over to my enemies. How could there be such a large company of bhikkhus, 1250 bhikkhus, without any sound of sneezing or coughing, or any noise at all? Do not be afraid, great king. Do not be afraid. I am not deceiving you, your majesty, or betraying you, or turning you over to your enemies. Go forward, great king. Go straight forward. Those are lamps burning in the pavilion hall. The question on the fruits of recluseship. Then King Ajatazatu, having gone by elephant as far as he could, 
dismounted and approached the door of the pavilion hall on foot. Having approached, he asked Jivaka, but where, Jivaka, is the exalted one? That is the exalted one, great king. He is the one sitting against the middle pillar, facing east, in front of the company of Bhikkhus. King Ajatazatu then approached the exalted one and stood to one side. As he stood there surveying the company of Bhikkhus, which sat in complete silence as serene as a calm lake, he uttered the following joyful exclamation, May my son, the Prince Udayabhata, enjoy such peace as the company of Bhikkhus now enjoys. The exalted one said, Do your thoughts, great king, follow the call of your affection. Venerable sir, I love my son, the Prince Udayabhata. May he enjoy such peace as the company of Bhikkhus now enjoys. King Ajatazatu then paid homage to the exalted one, reverently saluted the company of Bhikkhus, sat down to one side, and said to the exalted one, Venerable Sir, I would like to ask the exalted one about a certain point, if he would take the time to answer my question. Ask whatever you wish to, great king. There are, Venerable Sir, various crafts, such as elephant trainers, horse trainers, charioteers, archers, standard bearers, camp marshals, commandos, high royal officers, front-line soldiers, bull warriors, military heroes, mail-clad warriors, domestic slaves, confectioners, barbers, bath attendants, cooks, garland makers, lawn drymen, weavers, basket makers, potters, statisticians, accountants, and various other crafts of a similar nature. All those, who practice these crafts, enjoy here and now the visible fruits of their crafts. They obtain happiness and joy themselves, and they give happiness and joy to their parents, wives, and children, and their friends and colleagues. They establish an excellent presentation of gifts to recluses and Brahmins, leading to heaven, ripening in happiness, conducing to a heavenly rebirth. Is it possible, Venerable Sir, to point out, any fruit of recluseship that is similarly visible here and now. Do you remember, great king, ever asking other recluses and Brahmins this question? I do remember asking them, venerable sir. If it isn't troublesome for you, please tell us how they answered. It is not troublesome for me, venerable sir, when the exalted one or anyone like him is present. Then speak, great king. The doctrine of Puranakisapa one time, I approached Puranakisapa, exchanged greetings and courtesies with him, and sat down to one side. I then asked him, as in 14, if he could point out any fruit of recluseship visible here and now. When I had finished speaking, Puranakisapa said to me, Great King, if one acts or induces others to act, mutilates or induces others to mutilate, tortures or induces others to torture, inflicts sorrow or induces others to inflict sorrow, oppresses or induces others to oppress, intimidates or induces others to intimidate, if one destroys life, takes what is not given, breaks into houses, plunders wealth, commits burglary, ambushes highways, commits adultery, speaks falsehood, one does no evil. If with a razor-edged disc one were to reduce all the living beings on this earth to a single heap and pile of flesh, by doing so there would be no evil or outcome of evil. If one were to go along the south bank of the Ganges killing and inducing others to kill, mutilating and inducing others to mutilate, torturing and inducing others to torture, by doing so there would be no evil or outcome of evil. If one were to go along the north bank of the Ganges giving gifts and inducing others to give gifts, making offerings and inducing others to make offerings, by doing so there would be no merit or outcome of merit. By giving, self-control, restraint, and truthful speech there is no merit or outcome of merit. Thus, Venerable Sir, when I asked Purana Kisipa about a visible fruit of recluseship, he explained to me, his doctrine of, the inefficacy of action. Venerable Sir, just as if one asked about a mango would speak about a breadfruit, or as if one asked about a breadfruit would speak about a mango, 
In the same way when I asked Purana Kisipa about a visible fruit of recluseship he explained to me, his doctrine of, the inefficacy of action. Then, venerable sir, I thought to myself, one like myself should not think of troubling a recluse or Brahmin living in his realm. So I neither rejoiced in the statement of Purana Kisipa nor did I reject it. But, though I neither rejoiced in it nor rejected it, I still felt dissatisfied, yet did not utter a word of dissatisfaction. Without accepting his doctrine, without embracing it, I got up from my seat and left. The doctrine of Makhali Gozala another time, Venerable Sir, I approached Makhali Gozala, exchanged greetings and courtesies with him, and sat down to one side. I then asked him, as in 14, if he could point out a fruit of recluseship visible here and now. When I had finished speaking, Mac Holly. Gozala said to me, Great King, there is no cause or condition for the defilement of beings, beings are defiled without any cause or condition. There is no cause or condition for the purification of beings, beings are purified without cause or condition. There is no self-determination, no determination by others, no personal determination. There is no power, no energy, no personal strength, no personal fortitude. All sentient beings, all living beings, all creatures, all souls, are helpless, powerless, devoid of energy. Undergoing transformation by destiny, circumstance, and nature, they experience pleasure and pain in the six classes of men. There are 1400,000 principal modes of origin, for living beings, and 6,000, others, and 600, others. There are 500 kinds of kama and 5 kinds of kama and 3 kinds of kama and full kama and half kama. There are 62 pathways, 62 sub-eons, 6 classes of men, 8 stages in the life of man, 4900 modes of livelihood, 4900 kinds of wanderers, 4900 abodes of nagas, 2000 faculties, 3000 hells, 36 realms of dust, 7 spheres of percipient beings, 7 spheres of non-percipient beings, 7 kinds of jointed plants, 7 kinds of gods, 7 kinds of human beings, 7 kinds of demons, 7 great lakes, 7 major kinds of knots, 700 minor kinds of knots, 7 major precipices, 700 minor precipices, 7 major kinds of dreams, 700 minor kinds of dreams, 8400,000 great eons. The foolish and the wise, having roamed and wandered through these, will alike make an end to suffering. Though one might think, by this moral discipline or observance or austerity or holy life I will ripen unripened kama and eliminate ripened kama whenever it comes up, that cannot be. For pleasure and pain are measured out. S.A. Sarah's limits are fixed, and they can neither be shortened nor extended. There is no advancing forward and no falling back. Just as, when a ball of string is thrown, it rolls along unwinding until it comes to its end, in the same way, the foolish and the wise roam and wander, for the fixed length of time, after which they make an end to suffering. Thus, Venerable Sir, when I asked Makhali Gozala about a visible fruit of recluseship, he explained to me, his doctrine of, purification through wandering in S.A. Sarah. Venerable Sir, just as if one asked about a mango would speak about a breadfruit, or as if one asked about a breadfruit would speak about a mango, in the same way, when I asked Makhali Gozala about a visible fruit of recluseship, he explained to me, his doctrine of, purification through wandering in S.A. Sarah. Then, Venerable Sir, I thought to myself, one like myself should not think of troubling a recluse or Brahmin living in his realm. So I neither rejoiced in the statement of Makhali Gozala nor did I reject it. But, though I neither rejoiced in it nor rejected it, I still felt dissatisfied, yet did not utter a word of dissatisfaction. Without accepting his doctrine, without embracing it, I got up from my seat and left. The doctrine of Ajitakesakambala another time, Venerable Sir, 
I approached Ajita Kesakambala, exchanged greetings and courtesies with him, and sat down to one side. I then asked him, as in 14, if he could point out a fruit of recluseship visible here and now. When I had finished speaking, Ajita Kesakambala said to me, Great King, there is no giving, no offering, no liberality. There is no fruit or result of good and bad actions. There is no present world, no world beyond, no mother, no father, no beings who have taken rebirth. In the world there are no recluses and brahmins of right attainment and right practice who explain this world and the world beyond on the basis of their own direct knowledge and realization. A person is composed of the four primary elements. When he dies, the earth, in his body, returns to and merges with the external body of earth, the water, in his body, returns to and merges with the external body of water, the fire, in his body, returns to and merges with the external body of fire, the air, in his body, returns to and merges with the external body of air. His sense faculties pass over into space. Four men carry the corpse along on a bier. His eulogies are sounded until they reach the charnel ground. His bones turn pigeon-colored. His meritorious offerings end in ashes. The practice of giving is a doctrine of fools. Those who declare that there is an afterlife speak only false, empty prattle. With the breaking up of the body, the foolish and the wise alike are annihilated and utterly perish. They do not exist after death. Thus, Venerable Sir, when I asked Ajita Kesakambala about a visible fruit of recluseship, he explained to me, his doctrine of, annihilation. Venerable Sir, just as if one asked about a mango would speak about a breadfruit, or as if one asked about a breadfruit would speak about a mango, in the same way, when I asked Ajita Kesakambala about a visible fruit of recluseship, he explained to me, his doctrine of, annihilation. Then, Venerable Sir, I thought to myself, one like myself should not think of troubling a recluse or Brahmin living in his realm. So I neither rejoiced in the statement of Ajita Kesakambala nor did I reject it. But though I neither rejoiced in it nor rejected it, I still felt dissatisfied, yet did not utter a word of dissatisfaction. Without accepting his doctrine, without embracing it, I got up from my seat and left. The Doctrine of Pakud Hakakayana Another time, Venerable Sir, I approached Pakud Hakakayana, exchanged greetings and courtesies with him, and sat down to one side. I then asked him, as in 14, if he could point out a fruit of recluseship visible here and now. When I had finished speaking, Pakud Hakakayana said to me, Great King, there are seven bodies that are unmade, unfashioned, uncreated, without a creator, barren, stable as a mountain peak, standing firm like a pillar. They do not alter, do not change, do not obstruct one another, they are incapable of causing one. Another either pleasure or pain, or both pleasure and pain. What are the seven? The body of earth, the body of water, the body of fire, the body of air, pleasure, pain, and the soul as the seventh. Among these there is no killer nor one who causes killing, no hearer nor one who causes hearing, no cognizer nor one who causes cognition. If someone were to cut off, another person's, head with a sharp sword, he would not be taking, the other's, life. The sword merely passes through the space between the seven bodies. Thus, Venerable Sir, when I asked Pakud Hakakayana about a visible fruit of recluseship, he answered me in a completely irrelevant way. Venerable Sir, just as if one asked about a mango would speak about a breadfruit, or as if one asked about a breadfruit would speak about a mango, in the same way, when I asked Pakud Hakakayana about a visible fruit of recluseship, he answered me in a completely irrelevant way. Then, Venerable Sir, I thought to myself, one like myself should not think of troubling a recluse or Brahmin living in his realm. So I neither rejoiced in the statement of Pakud Hakakayana nor did I reject it. 
but though I neither rejoiced in it nor rejected it, I still felt dissatisfied, yet did not utter a word of dissatisfaction. Without accepting his doctrine, without embracing it, I got up from my seat and left. The doctrine of Niganthanataputta another time, Venerable Sir, I approached Niganthanataputta, exchanged greetings and courtesies with him, and sat down to one side. I then asked him, as in 14, if he could point out a fruit of recluseship visible here and now. When I had finished speaking, Niganthanataputta said to me, Great King, a Nigantha, a knotless one, is restrained with a fourfold restraint. How so? Herein, great king, a Nigantha is restrained with regard to all water, he is endowed with the avoidance of all evil, he is cleansed by the avoidance of all evil, he is suffused with the avoidance of all evil. Great king, when a Nigantha is restrained with this fourfold restraint, he is called a knotless one who is self-perfected, self-controlled, and self-established. Thus, Venerable Sir, when I asked Nigantha Nataputta about a visible fruit of recluseship, he explained to me the fourfold restraint. Venerable Sir, just as if one asked about a mango would speak about a breadfruit, or as if one asked about a breadfruit would speak about a mango, in the same way, when I asked Nigantha Nataputta about a visible fruit of recluseship, he explained to me the fourfold restraint. Then, Venerable Sir, I thought to myself, one like myself should not think of troubling a recluse or Brahmin living in his realm. So I neither rejoiced in the statement of Nigantha nor did I reject it. But though I neither rejoiced in it nor rejected it, I still felt dissatisfied, yet did not utter a word of dissatisfaction. Without accepting his doctrine, without embracing it, I got up from my seat and left. The doctrine of Sanjaya Balatthaputta another time, Venerable Sir, I approached Sanjaya Balatthaputta, exchanged greetings and courtesies with him, and sat down to one side. I then asked him, as in 14, if he could point out any fruit of recluseship visible here and now. When I had finished speaking, Sanjaya Balatthaputta said to me, If you ask me, is there a world beyond? If I thought that there is a world beyond, I would declare to you there is a world beyond. But I do not say it is this way, nor it is that way, nor it is otherwise. I do not say it is not so, nor do I say it is not not so. Similarly, you might ask me the following questions. Is there no world beyond? Is it that there both is and is not a world beyond? Is it that there neither is nor is not a world beyond? Are there beings who have taken rebirth? Are there no beings who have taken rebirth? Is it that there both are and are not beings who have taken rebirth? Is it that there neither are nor are not beings who have taken rebirth? Is there fruit and result of good and bad actions? Is there no fruit and result of good and bad actions? Is it that there both are and are not fruit and result of good and bad actions? Is it that there neither are nor are not fruit and result of good and bad actions? Does the Tathagata exist after death? Does the Tathagata not exist after death? Does the Tathagata both exist and not exist after death? Does the Tathagata neither exist nor not exist after death? If I thought that it was so, I would declare to you. It is so. But do I not say it is this way, nor it is that way, nor it is otherwise? I do not say it is not so, nor do I say it is not not so. Thus, Venerable Sir, when I asked Sanjaya Balatthaputta about a visible fruit of recluseship, he answered me evasively. Venerable Sir, just as if one asked about a mango would speak about a breadfruit, or as if one asked about a breadfruit would speak about a mango, in the same way, when I asked Sanjaya Balatthaputta about a visible fruit of recluseship, he answered me evasively. Then, Venerable Sir, I thought to myself, one like myself should not think of troubling a recluse or Brahmin living in his realm. So I neither rejoiced in the statement of Sanjaya Balatthaputta nor did I reject it. But though I neither rejoiced in it nor rejected it, 
I still felt dissatisfied, yet did not utter a word of dissatisfaction. Without accepting his doctrine, without embracing it, I got up from my seat and left. The first visible fruit of recluseship so, venerable sir, I asked the exalted one, there are, venerable sir, various crafts, such as elephant trainers, horse trainers, charioteers, archers, standard bearers, camp marshals, commandos, high royal officers, front-line soldiers, bull warriors, military heroes, male-clad warriors, domestic slaves, confectioners, barbers, bath attendants, cooks, garland makers, lawn drymen, weavers, basket makers, potters, statisticians, accountants, and various other crafts of a similar nature. All those, who practice these crafts, enjoy here and now the visible fruits of their craft. They obtain happiness and joy themselves, and they give happiness and joy to their parents, their wives and children, their friends and colleagues. They establish an excellent presentation of gifts to recluses and Brahmins, leading to heaven, ripening in happiness, conducing to a heavenly rebirth. Is it possible, venerable sir, to point out any fruit of recluseship that is similarly visible here and now? It is, great king. But let me question you about this matter. Answer as you think fit. What do you think, great king? Suppose you have a slave, a workman who rises up before you, retires after you, does whatever you want, acts always for your pleasure, speaks politely to you, and is ever on the lookout to see that you are satisfied. The thought might occur to him, it is wonderful and marvelous, the destiny and result of meritorious deeds. For this King Ajaytasatu is a human being, and I too am a human being, yet King Ajaytasatu enjoys himself fully endowed and supplied with the five strands of sense pleasure as if he were a god, while I am his slave, his workman, rising before him, retiring after him, doing whatever he wants, acting always for his pleasure, speaking politely to him, ever on the lookout to see that he is satisfied. I could be like him if I were to do meritorious deeds. Let me then shave off my hair and beard, put on saffron robes, and go forth from home to homelessness. After some time he shaves off his hair and beard, puts on saffron robes, and goes forth from home to homelessness. Having gone forth he dwells restrained in body, speech, and mind, content with the simplest food and shelter, delighting in solitude. Suppose your men were to report all this to you. Would you say, bring that man back to me, men? Let him again become my slave, my workman, rising before me, retiring after me, doing whatever I want, acting always for my pleasure, speaking politely to me, ever on the lookout to see that I am satisfied. Certainly not, venerable sir. Rather, we would pay homage to him, rise up out of respect for him, invite him to a seat, and invite him to accept from us robes, alms food, dwelling and medicinal requirements. And we would provide him righteous protection, defense, and security. What do you think, great king? If such is the case, is there or is there not a visible fruit of recluseship? There certainly is, venerable sir. This, great king, is the first fruit of recluseship, visible here and now, that I point out to you. The second visible fruit of recluseship. Is it possible, venerable sir, to point out some other fruit of recluseship visible here and now? It is, great king. But let me question you about this matter. Answer as you think fit. What do you think, great king? Suppose there is a farmer, a householder, who pays taxes to maintain the royal revenue. The thought might occur to him, it is wonderful and marvelous, the destiny and result of meritorious deeds. For this King Ajaytasatu is a human being, and I too am a human being. Yet King Ajaytasatu enjoys himself fully endowed and supplied with the five strands of sense pleasure as if he were a god, while I am a farmer, a householder, who pays taxes to maintain the royal revenue. 
I could be like him if I were to do meritorious deeds. Let me then shave off my hair and beard, put on saffron robes, and go forth from home to homelessness. After some time, he abandons his accumulation of wealth, be it large or small. Abandons his circle of relatives, be it large or small, he shaves off his hair and beard, puts on saffron robes, and goes forth from home to homelessness. Having gone forth, he dwells restrained in body, speech, and mind, content with the simplest food and shelter, delighting in solitude. Suppose your men were to report all this to you. Would you say, bring that man back to me, men? Let him again become a farmer, a householder, who pays taxes to maintain the royal revenue. 